It's good to be back. Usually I think that the phrase good morning is an oxymoron, but I am happy to be here. My wife and I really do love students. We had two students for dinner on Saturday, and they really tasted good, believe me. Anyway, all right, four quick announcements before I dive in. First of all, Friday night, you, some people are just getting the joke, thank you. Um, Friday night on this very stage at 7.30, uh, we are gonna be hosting a performance of the Trojan Women. It is an authentic Greek tragedy with a Greek acting troupe from Greece that is gonna be performing it just like they did 2,500 years ago. And uh, if you bought tickets, it would be very expensive, but we happen to have a number of complimentary tickets for HBU faculty, staff, and students. So if you are free this Friday at 7.30 uh, to see the Trojan Women, Dr. Robert Stacy, he's the Dean of the Honors College, if you go visit him over the next couple days, uh, if we have some extra tickets, uh, uh, you can have a complimentary ticket and come. You don't wanna miss this. All right, three quick things. First of all, if you are not in freshman year seminar, uh, we are in the midst of a series on mere Christianity. All of the uh, freshman, honor, uh, freshman uh, seminar students are reading mere Christianity. Uh, last time we met, we talked about book one and two of mere Christianity. This morning, we're gonna talk about book three. But don't worry if you're not part of freshman year seminar, this speech can stand on its own, but we're kind of in the middle of a series. Uh, the next thing I wanna say is, uh, the last time I spoke, I went really, really fast. And I guess I went a little fast for some of you. So today, I'm going to just choose a few topics and go a little bit slower. So if you do have a, a handout or an outline that I made up, I'm not going to cover all of it. I'm just going to cover the highlights. Finally, before we start, last time I spoke on Monday, I had to leave here super fast to give another speech. But today, I can hang out for a half hour. So after it's over, I'll hang out back there. If you have any questions, uh, please come see me. All right. Ever since Sigmund Freud, for the last hundred years, one of the most common criticisms of Christianity, theism in general, but Christianity particularly, has been this. Christianity is just wish fulfillment. You just want it to be true. You just want to believe there's a loving God up there that cares about you. And you just make up Christianity or make up theism, a belief in God, to feel good about yourself. Well, I will admit that that may be true in some people's lives, right? I mean, some people do come for the wrong motives, but what people often don't want to admit is that a lot of atheists become atheists for wish fulfillment as well. In other words, their wish is for God not to be true. Now, why would you not want God to exist? Well, whenever you want to do something, that you know in your conscience you shouldn't be doing, it would be very convenient if God didn't exist. And folks, if you read, uh, there's a whole gr a group of books by a, a group of people known as the Neo-Atheists or the New Atheists. Probably the most famous books are The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins and God is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens, but there's several other books as well. And if you read them carefully, most of these neo-atheists will actually admit at some point that part of their atheism did come from the fact that they wanted to do what they wanted to do. And they're even admitting that usually it had to do with sex, especially when they were younger. I don't want anybody telling me what to do with my body. So let's be honest. A lot of atheism comes from wish fulfillment as well. C.S. Lewis, who wrote Mere Christianity, was an atheist for about half of his life. And C.S. Lewis admits that he did not want God to be true. In fact, when Lewis accepted God, first he accepted God, then two years later he accepted Jesus. But the very first moment when he knelt down and admitted that God is God, Lewis says that he was the most miserable convert in all of England dragged kicking and screaming into the kingdom of God, looking this way and that, trying to find a way of escape. He didn't want God to be true. Why? Because Lewis was somebody who just wanted to be left alone. Lewis was never, quote, some big sinner, right? But like all of us, he was fallen. He was a sinner. He did things. He said things. He thought things that he knew God would not approve of. And he really didn't want God there. He felt, as a lot of Americans feel today, as maybe some of you in the audience feel this morning, that Christian morality is just about interference. 
Why doesn't God just stay out of my business? It's like you want to look at God and say, mind your own beeswax. I want to do what I want to do. I mean, heck, as long as what I do with my own body doesn't hurt anybody else, then why should you care? Just leave me alone. And so Lewis said in the beginning, when it came to Christian morality, he wanted God to leave him alone. He thought morality and ethics was merely a form of divine interference. But as he matured in the faith and as he came to write book three of Mere Christianity, which focuses on morality and ethics, Lewis realized something. Christian morality is not about interference. It's a way to keep the human machine functioning properly. Without Christian morality, we, and, and I don't just mean, I mean Judeo-Christian, I mean just morality in general, we all have a conscience, but specifically the morality that's laid forth in the Bible, it's there to prevent us from disaster and chaos. Lewis uses an analogy in the beginning of book three of Mere Christianity, and he compares us to a fleet of ships that's going along the ocean. Now, you do need people to regulate the movement of those ships so that they don't collide with each other and smash into each other. And for a lot of people, today especially, this is the only thing that morality should do, right? Those Americans who say, I can do anything I want as long as I don't hurt anybody. All we need morality for is to make sure I don't hurt someone else. But Lewis explains that it's not enough just to have a, the, the ocean version of air traffic control. It's not enough just to have someone in the tower making sure the planes or ships don't collide. You also have to make sure that each individual ship is in tip-top shape. Because if the individual ships or planes start falling apart or start going faulty, then you will have chaos. And the focus on each individual ship that's the other part of morality that our modern world doesn't always like. It does make a difference what I do with my own body. You know, people are starting to realize that there really is no such thing as a victimless crime. Now, those of you who are freshmen, you are very young, but do you remember a business called Enron? Does anybody remember Enron? Okay. The, the sins, the crimes, the unethical behavior that led to the collapse of Enron are what some people would have called victimless crimes, right? They're playing with the books. Who's hurt, right? The IRS is hurt, big deal, right? Who's hurt, right? We, we think of it as a victimless crime. But what we learned in Houston was that so-called victimless crime had terrible repercussions. And I'm sure if you ask your parents, probably every one of them knew somebody that lost their job because of the fallout from Enron. People that had nothing to do with the company, Enron, lost their jobs. And what about husbands and wives? Well, I'm tired of my wife. I think we'll get a divorce. That's a victimless crime, as long as my wife and I agree. Isn't that a victimless crime? No, it's not. Ask the children who are left with divorced parents. So there really are no such thing as victimless crimes. All right. Let's move on and talk about virtue. Now, book three is about morality and ethics, but Lewis wants to talk about it in the more traditional way as virtue and vice. So let's talk about virtue. What is virtue? For a lot of people, when Lewis was writing, but I think even more today, I think mere Christianity is even more true than it, today than it was when it was written, which is the truth with almost all great books. <sighs> virtue is not a feeling. A lot of us think, oh, I feel charitable towards someone, or I feel brave, or I feel just. And we think that virtue is a feeling inside of us. But it is not. Virtue, as Lewis defines it, virtue is a quality of character. It is a quality of character that comes from doing virtuous actions. By acting in a virtuous way, we build up in ourselves the character of virtue. Now, what's fascinating about Lewis's definition is even though it fits in very well with Christian theology and philosophy, 
It ultimately goes back to a philosopher named Aristotle, who lived 400 years before the New Testament was written. Lewis often borrows from what Dante would call virtuous pagans. Aristotle had a conscience. He was not saved. He didn't know Christ. He was a pre-Christian. But Lewis shows us that, you know, the higher pagans, as we call them, also understood the nature of virtue. Virtue is not a feeling. Virtue is acting in a certain way so that we build up virtue. Let's put it this way. Have you ever heard someone say, virtue is its own reward? Well, what does that mean? First of all, I think it's true that generally when you act virtuously, you, you do win out in the end, but not always. What it also means is that one of the great and hidden benefits of virtue is that the more you act virtuously, the more you enjoy virtue. That's why virtue is its own reward. The more you become a virtuous person based on virtuous behavior, the more you enjoy virtue. And this is important because I don't know if any of you grew up in a very, very strict Christian home or church, but unfortunately, a lot of Americans who have that sort of puritanical background, I use that in a negative sense, there's a good sense of Puritan, but in the negative sense of puritanical, have any of you struggled with this? You're doing a Christian ministry and you start enjoying it and you say, uh-oh, I must not really be serving God. I can't be serving God unless I'm miserable. No. If you are truly serving God, if you are truly acting virtuously, you will come to enjoy virtue, right? The more you act it, the more you become it. But this also works backwards. When I was an undergraduate, I was an English and history double major. And one of the books I'll never forget reading was a book called American Slave, American Free by a guy named Edmund Morgan, a great uh, historian of America. And he made an argument that at first seemed counterintuitive, but he proved it. We think that in our country, racism led to slavery. What he proves in his book is it's actually the opposite. Slavery led to racism. And the way he proves it is by quoting journals and diaries and things that people wrote before slavery. And he noticed that when white people were talking about black people, there was no sense of, you know, the skin being different. They might have been just prejudice in general against maybe an African, let's say. But there was no sense that black skin as opposed to white skin was somehow different. And believe me, I, I teach the ancients. You don't see that in ancient Greece or Rome either in terms of skin color. But guess what? After slavery becomes a part of American culture, suddenly you start reading racist references. Why? Because when you treat somebody badly, you end up disliking that person. I hate to say that, but that often happens with uh, managers. If you ever had a manager who treated you badly, you might think, oh, the guy was so mean to me, now he'll probably be nice to me. To make up for it? No. When a manager treats you poorly, he usually treats you even worse for the next month because he's got to justify the fact that he treated you unvirtuously. And so he now thinks of you in negative terms. Unfortunately, that's the way it works. Benjamin Franklin said, the best way to make friends is get that person to do something nice for you. Once they do something nice for you, they will start thinking of you as a friend. That's just the way the human machinery, the human mind works. All right, let's move from virtue to one specific virtue where this becomes clear and where Lewis really needs to teach us something. And that's the virtue of love. Again, in our modern day, we think of love as a feeling. Well, yeah, it is a feeling, but love ultimately is an action. If all you have is the feeling, it's sooner or later going to go away. But if you have the action, the feeling will follow. Now, I'm a very romantic fellow, and yes, I did choose my wife on the basis of being in love, as I think most of you will, right? But if the only basis of your marriage is being in love, in other words, the, the feeling of love, the warm fuzzies, the, all of that sort of stuff, if that is the full basis of your marriage, it's probably not going to last very long because feelings don't last forever. 
Your love needs to have working clothes on. Now, most of you in this audience are young. You're 18. Uh, I may try matching you up with somebody, but it'll probably be a few years before you get married. I want you to remember this when you get married, 10 years down the road, okay? You've been married several years, and let's start with the gentleman. And after a few years, you start saying, you know, I don't think I love my wife anymore. The, the warm fuzzies aren't there. The, my heart is not jumping into my throat every time I hear her speak or look at her. I guess the marriage is kaput. This is what you do. For the next two months, treat your wife as if you love her. If you treat her the way you treated her on your honeymoon, as if you love her, after a few months, the feelings will return. Now, I know from an American point of view and from a romantic point of view, and I teach the romantic poets, that sounds terribly phony, maybe even hypocritical. But it's not. That's the way human beings work. You treat somebody with love, you will come to love them. Ladies, after several years, you may start thinking, you know, I don't think I respect my husband anymore, right? You know, when you're first dating, you think your, your boyfriend or your husband is like the smartest guy in the world and all that sort of stuff. Um, and after a while, you think, I don't respect this guy anymore. He's really a loser. <laughs> I hope you won't get that far. You know what you start doing for the next two months? Treat him as if you respect him. And if you do, the feelings will return. And guess what? If you treat your husband with respect, he will often become a person worthy of respect. Just like if you treat your wife with love, she will become lovable. That doesn't mean your husband's going to suddenly become a CEO or your wife's going to become a supermodel. That's not what I mean. They're going to become a person worthy of respect, worthy of love. Please remember that. Put that in a, in a note and, and pull it out uh, after you've been married for seven years, when the seven-year itch comes and you start wondering. Okay? We, this, this is such an important thing for Lewis. It comes up in all of his different works. And again, I believe it's even more important today than when Lewis first wrote this. Because more and more we've become a feeling-based culture. Again, there's nothing wrong with feeling in and of itself. Feeling is good. It's part of the human person. But feeling alone is not going to do it. Love is an action. Some of you probably uh, had a preacher who told you that the wonderful love chapter, love is patient, love is kind, all of those are verbs in Greek. Well, love is a noun, but the word is patient, is kind, those are all verbs. Okay? Love is an action, not just a feeling. So please keep that in mind uh, as you go through your life and as you treat people and as you try to grow in virtue. Feeling alone won't do it. All right, like I said, I want to just pull just a few things out of book three that I think are really important and that I hope you'll remember uh, for quite a long time. All right, let's look at something else. The Bible tells us something that's a little hard to do. It says, judge not lest you be judged. And that confuses a lot of Christians because, well, aren't we supposed to judge? Aren't we supposed to call sin, sin? Well, yes, we are, okay? We're not supposed to overlook sin. Sin is sin, and we need to be aware of it, especially within our churches. But part of the reason that we are told not to judge is this. I still remember the first time I read this when I was an undergraduate in Mere Christianity, and it just blew my mind and took a weight off my shoulders. Lewis says this, God does not judge us on the basis of our raw material, but on what we do with that raw material. Let me say that again. God does not judge us on our raw material, but on what we do with it. Folks, every one of us has different burdens, different struggles, different temptations. You might have one guy who is really tempted with sexual sin, lust, pornography, all that sort of stuff, but this guy is never tempted to anger. He's always laid back. He never loses his cool. He's always uh, patient with people. Then you might have another guy who is never tempted by the lustful things, but he is filled with anger. Somebody cuts him off on the road. He wants to pull out a gun and shoot him. We all have different struggles, right? And none of us can really know the struggles of another person, right? We all come with certain temptations that are harder for us. We all come with a background 
that has made it very difficult for us to live virtuously in this area or this area or this area. Now, this does not take away from sin. Sin is sin. But we don't judge because we don't know what that person is struggling with. I'll give you an example from my own life. I'm a very conservative person. I am no big fan of the guys uh, during the Vietnam War that avoided the draft and ran off to Canada. I'm no big fan of those guys, but you know what? I never make fun of them. I'll make fun of Aggies, but I don't make fun of these guys. Why? Because in the moments when I'm honest with myself, how do I know what I would have done in that situation? Right? Maybe I would have done the same thing. Actually, I would have been in college and probably wouldn't have had to make the decision. Right? We need, Lewis makes it even hard. That was easy. Lewis makes it hard on us in mere Christianity, which started during World War II. He says, how do you know what you would have done if you had had the upbringing of one of the Nazi leaders, you'd had that upbringing, and then you were given absolute power? How do you know you wouldn't have been just as bad? Now, again, that's not to take away from the sin and the evil acts that those people committed. But we have to be careful we don't get in our high horse and say, oh, I would have been good. I'm a huge fan of Martin Luther King, and I'm particularly a fan of an of of essay he wrote called Letter from the Birmingham Jail. But I fault him on one thing. In Letter from the Birmingham Jail, he reminds us that sometimes something that is illegal is actually the moral thing to do. And he says there that if I was in Germany in the 40s, I would have hidden Jews. Well, I wish he had said, if I was there, I wish I would have done that. Now, I personally, I think Martin Luther King probably would have done that. He was a brave man. But how do we know, right? It's very easy for us to say, oh, I would have done what Corey Ten Boom did. That was the Christian lady that hid Jews in the attic and ended up being put in a concentration camp herself. It's easy to say that. I certainly would like to believe I would have done the right thing. But how do we know? Again, this is not to get us away from sin, but to help us realize that we don't really know what someone else is struggling with. God is just. Right? You know, one of the things that bothered Lewis, and it comes up in, even in his fiction, is this idea that all Christians should have the same personality, that all true Christians should be walking around like this all day. <laughs> Hello, I'm always happy. I'm on Jesus fuel, and I'm very happy. All right. Now, I tend personally to be a rather happy person. I've got a sanguine nature. It's easy for me to smile and be happy and overlook things. But that's partly not because I'm a better person than someone else, but because that's my nature. I've got Greek blood in me. That's my nature. I am sanguine. There are other people for whom, for an, a multitude of reasons, not only their personality matrix, but the way they were raised, that smiling at someone is the hardest thing you can ask them to do. It might be a greater moral victory for this Christian to just smile than another Christian to whip out his book, a checkbook, and write a check for $10,000 $10, and send it to charity. Why? Because the struggle that the person went through to smile is an incredible moral victory. Right? We need to understand that. We need to be patient with one another. A lot of people say, Look it. Look how this guy behaves. That proves Christianity isn't true. Lewis says, why don't you ask yourself what that guy would have been like had he not been a Christian? <laughs> Maybe he would have been a lot worse. Maybe I or you would have been a lot worse if we hadn't been redeemed by Christ and had the Holy Spirit inside of us. Again, please, this is not a way to say overlook sin. Sin is sin. A bad choice, a, a vicious or non-virtuous choice is a non-virtuous choice but we need to understand the struggles that people have. Lewis says, uh, one of the things we're called to be is courageous, right? have courage. Well, let's say you have a phobia, a phobia against spiders or something, whatever it is, and that phobia makes it very hard for you to be courageous. Well, Lewis says, let's say you go to a Freudian psychoanalyst. Lewis thought Freud was wrong about many things, but he, didn't dis he wasn't against psychoanalysis as a method. And he said, let's say through hypnosis and whatever else, the psychotherapist is able to cure you of your phobia against spiders. That doesn't mean you are now a brave person. What it means is you are now on a more level playing field with the guy next to you. But now you still have to choose to be 
courageous. Right? So even when the impediment is removed, okay, the Bible says, you know, we need to use our tongue properly, use our tongue to edify people. Let's say you're somebody with a stutter and you have a hard time speaking. Well, let's say a, a speech pathologist helps you to heal that stutter. Well, now you still have to choose, how am I going to use my tongue? Now my tongue works a little bit easier than it did before, but I still need to choose whether I will use my tongue to build up or tear down. I hope this is making sense. I think these are some of the important lessons that Lewis can teach us today. Again, it's not the raw material. It's what we do with it. It is our choices that are turning us into people that will either be with God in heaven or apart from God in hell. Lewis helps us, instead of thinking about heaven and hell as destinations, think about heaven and hell as two different processes. Heaven is something we become, but hell is also something we become. Lewis explains, every time we make a choice to move towards God and away from our sin, or make a choice to reject God and embrace our sin and our egocentrism and our narcissism, narcissism, every time we do that, we're sort of affecting our soul. Every time we choose vice over virtue, we are putting another little twist in our soul till we're all twisted up in knots. The choices we make make us into certain people. That's not to say we choose God or to take away from grace. But in this world, our choices are making us into certain people. Remember that. The, cho the little choices you make, the choices you make in your mind and with your tongue, not just with your hands, those choices are making you into certain people. And remember, although the sins of the flesh are sinful, our, our society forgets that, the sins of the soul are even worse. That's why the prostitutes were accepting Jesus when the Pharisees were rejecting him. Okay? Let's look at it, just a few more things. Let me see where my time is here. We do have time. Very good. Okay. Lewis explains to us in book three of Mere Christianity that everybody in the past knew that there were seven basic virtues. And Lewis explains this right in the beginning of book three. There are the four classical virtues, and there are the three theological virtues. The four classical virtues are the virtues that virtuous pagans like Plato and Aristotle or Cicero or Virgil knew about, right? Because even people who don't know Christ, according to the Bible, have access to what we call general revelation. We have a conscience that God put in us, and we can do good actions. That doesn't mean we can save ourselves, but we are capable of limited virtuous action. And the higher pagans, and again, when I say pagan, I don't mean a UT frat boy. When I say pagan, I merely mean the ancient, that was a joke. I merely mean the ancient Greeks and Romans who lived before Christ. Okay, pagan is not being used as a, in a, um, in a, a way to, to, to look down on somebody. It's just a descriptor. The ancient pagans knew of the four virtues. And those four virtues that Lewis goes over are temperance or self-control, right? courage or fortitude. He talks about all these. Justice. And the other is wisdom or prudence. Right? And we are still called to follow those virtues. But Lewis explains, following all the medieval church fathers, that what the ancient pagans didn't know about were the three greater virtues. And those three greater virtues were waiting for the special revelation of Christ and the Bible to come into our world. And the three Christian or theological virtues that he talks about are faith, hope, and love. Remember that in 1 Corinthians 13? These three things remain faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of them is love. Now, many of you know that in the King James as faith, hope, and charity, right? Let me just explain quickly because this confuses modern people because our languages change over time. All right, I think most of you in this room are familiar with the fact that there are lots of different words for love in Greek, right? There's philia, friendship love, 
There's eros, which is more physical or erotic love. There's storge, which means affection. And there's agape. You all heard that word before? Agape is God's self-giving love, right? That's the love that reaches out of itself towards the other person. Well, the way you say agape in Latin is caritas. And the way you say caritas in English is charity. Now today, charity, the word, has become reduced to mean only giving money to the poor. But charity originally, coming from caritas, meant agape, self-giving love. So it is proper to say faith, hope, and charity, but usually I say love because we, we have to understand that we're talking about more than just giving money to the poor. Right? I remember uh, a group of uh, criminals named Faith, Hope, and Charity. Faith and Hope stole all the money, and they gave the money to charity. All right. Come on, you're getting slow out there. All right. Now, I want to end the talk this morning by saying something about faith, hope, and love out of book three of Mere Christianity. Let's start with love. This was another thing I read in Lewis that just freed me in a real exciting way and helped me to understand something I'd struggle with and maybe many of you are struggling with this morning. The Bible tells us, Christ himself tells us, that we are to love the sinner, but hate the sin. I'm sure you're all familiar with that phrase, and I'm sure many of you have said, but that's impossible. How can I really love the sinner and hate the sin at the same time? People have a lot of trouble with this today. Lewis had a lot of trouble with that as well, until he suddenly realized in one of those moments of insight, the aha moment, I have those aha moments a lot, you know, when the, when the flame opens up like that? That's why I've lost my hair, because I've had so many aha moments. But that light bulb flashes, and suddenly you understand something? Well, Lewis suddenly understood that almost every day of his life, he loved the sinner but hated the sin, because he did it to himself, right? When I commit a sin, I am angry at myself. I even hate myself for doing that bad thing. But I don't therefore hate myself. I hate the sin that I've done, but I continue to love myself. In fact, the number one reason I hate the sin is because I realize that it is warping me, the person that I love. Folks, please, the trouble with sin is not that it's fun. We still think that in our culture. You ever heard somebody say, why is it that everything I want to do is either illegal, immoral, or fattening? Have you heard that before? We have this crazy notion that sin is bad because it's fun. That's, again, the negative part of our Puritan heritage. No, the problem with sin is not that it's fun. The problem with sin, really, is that it's not fun at all. It might be fun for one second, but it doesn't even last to the next day half of the time, if not the next hour. We feel an inner sense of disgust that we've done this. It's not fun. I don't know how you're defining the word fun. Uh, I remember I went to a secular school, and I remember my roommate waking up, throwing up all over the place. Didn't look fun to me, especially when I had to clean it up. I was too nice of a guy. But anyway, the, uh, it's not fun. The problem with sin is it warps us. It perverts us. It twists us away from the person God created us to be. Sinning in a way, robs us of our humanity. It robs us of the spark of divinity God breathed into us at creation. So the reason we hate sin is because it's actually hurting the sinner. If you have a friend who's caught up in some kind of uh, addictive behavior, whether it's drugs, alcohol, whether it's promiscuity, whether it's greed, whether it's anger, if you've got a friend who's caught up in some type of addictive behavior, if you really love that friend, you will go up and confront them. And the reason you'll confront them is because as their friend, as someone who loves them, you realize that this sin is actually hurting them. It may be hurting them worse than anybody else. We call that bold love or tough love. And that's a hard thing to do. Only your very closest friend is going to, and only if they have pure motives, is going to tell you, is going to have the courage to tell you that this behavior is hurting you. It's twisting you on the inside. Lewis helps us to understand this. When we're loving the sinner and hating the sin, here's how we know if we're going bad. If we read something about a certain person, maybe somebody we don't like, and in it we discover that that person was even more bad than we thought, 
even more sinful than we thought. And that thought makes us excited. We're excited that sin is worse. Then Lewis says, we're on the path that is going to make us a devil eventually. Not literally a devil, but make us devilish. Right? We, we should hope that the sin is less, not that the sin is more. And if we truly love the sinner, then we will want to see the sin removed. You see, um, in the past, too many churches did a great job at hating the sin, but it often caused them to hate the sinner as well. In our day and age, I think we have the opposite problem. We try to love the sinner, but so much we start loving the sin. But if we love the sin and we encourage the sin, we are actually hurting the sinner. We are actually hating the sinner. Okay, two more points. Let's look at hope quickly. Hope has been one of the Christian virtues for the last 2,000 years. But in our day and age, hope has gotten bad press. People look at the word hope and say, oh, more of that pie in the sky, by and by. Why can't you be a realist? Hope is just putting on rose-colored glasses. No, hope in the Christian sense means trusting in the promises of God. Lewis says it's an irony, but it's true, that throughout history, it is often the people who have kept their eyes focused on heaven who actually made the world better. It was those God-intoxicated early Christians who were focused on the kingdom who got rid of infanticide and uh, gladiatorial matches. It was the Christians of the Middle Ages who were focused on God and the truth who built the university system. It was Christians like William Wilberforce who were focused on God who eliminated the slave trade. And I would add, after Lewis, uh, that it was the people who followed Martin Luther King, who were mostly strong Christians, who were focused on heaven, right? Who made the earth a better place. It is the people who only care about the earth, people like Lenin and Stalin, or Hitler, or Mao Zedong, or Pol Pot, or any of these, or, or, or Castro. It is the people who only cared about earth and thought they were going to make the earth into a utopia that have laid the earth a wasteland. Right? Lewis says many times, if you surrender earth and seek heaven, you will gain heaven and you'll get earth thrown in as well. But if you only care about the earth, you're going to lose heaven and you're going to end up losing the earth in the long run as well. If we want to gain our soul, we need to lose it. If we hold on to ourselves, we will lose God and we will eventually lose ourselves. But if we surrender ourselves to God, we get God and ourselves thrown in. It's a paradox, but it's true. Paradoxes are true. They're not contradictions. It's a seeming contradiction. But that's the way it works. One last thing. Let's talk about faith now. In our modern technological world, we seem to think that faith means believing in something I know isn't true. Have you ever heard someone say that? Believing in something I know isn't true. That's not faith, folks. That's stupidity, right? <laughs> faith, well, the Bible actually gives us a definition of faith. It's in Hebrews chapter 11, the great faith chapter. Faith is the evidence of things not seen, the assurance of things hoped for. We are believing in things that we can't see. We're not believing in things that we know are not true. See, a lot of people, especially in the Western world, they think that faith is something we accept on an emotional high and then reject because of reason and logic. Lewis says that happens sometimes, but usually it is the other way around. Faith is something we move towards because it is reasonable, it makes sense. It fits with the nature of reality of God, man, and the universe. We move towards faith. We embrace faith. But then what happens when we get sick or somebody we know dies or there's a disruption in our life? Then a flood of emotions and anger and whatnot overflow us. Lewis calls it a blitz. And our faith dissolves. It is not reason and logic that kill our faith. It is more often 
unregulated feelings and emotions that get the best of us and push us away. Lewis also tells us something uh, that we sometimes get mixed up. Oh, especially in academia, people seem to expect that if you are an intelligent Christian, that means that you will be continually putting your Christian faith to the test. Every time the scientists come up with a new idea, or the sociologists, or the philosophers, or whatever it is, every time a new idea pops up, we should immediately question everything we believe. Now that may sound smart on the surface, but it's not. And let me give you an analogy. What, and this is from Lewis. What would you think of a man who falls in love with a beautiful girl and courts her and asks her to marry him and they get married and they have a wonderful honeymoon and then when they get back from the honeymoon, starting that very day, every time his wife is 10 or 15 minutes late, every time his wife doesn't call him, every time she goes somewhere by herself, he immediately is suspicious that she's fooling around on him. What would you think of such a man? You would think he's a fool and a jerk and you would be right. And yet, that's what they expect Christians to do. Folks, Christianity may begin as a philosophical proposition that we accept, but that's not what it ends as. Christianity is a relationship, right? It's not a philosophical proposition that calls for our intellectual assent. Christianity is a person who wants our trust. C.S. Lewis says in, a, in, a, in an essay he wrote called Obstinacy and Belief. People look at the, remember the story of Doubting Thomas? Unless I put my fingers in the wounds, I will not believe. And then Jesus appears and says, go ahead. And he touches it and he says, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus says, you have believed because you have seen. But blessed are those who, see, who believe without seeing. And Lewis says, when Jesus says that, he is not so much reprimanding Thomas and saying you're a bad person. It's more as if he's saying, Thomas, Thomas, didn't you trust me? Right? We are putting our faith not in a philosophical proposition, but in a person, a person who died and rose again, a person who said, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Let me close with a quick prayer. Father God, I pray that you would instill in us this morning your virtues, especially faith, hope, and love. Help us, Lord, to move beyond mere feeling to truly loving and serving you and our fellow man, to love God and our neighbor. Help us, Lord, not to judge lest we be judged. Help us, Lord, to have bold love and to seek the good of our neighbor. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you all.